Hello everyone, my name is Sam Hanks and I'm a fifth year PhD student at Tufts University. I apologize for not being able to attend the conference and meet my fellow researchers here in person. I'm an, an internship in California, so I'll have to wait for a future conference to make your acquaintance. Uh, thanks to my co-authors, Rob Jacob, who is a human computer interaction professor at Tufts University in the computer science department, and my advisor as well. And to Tufts students, Maya Debellis, Yun Yobli, Rana Tenbrink, who, uh, the, the three of whom ran the study, and to Birir Muel, who is a Swedish psychologist who helped with some of the cognitive science for the paper. So in this short paper, I describe an experiment to evaluate the feasibility of a bidirectional brain-computer interface, which reads brain activation and, in response, attempts to alter it by administering an electrical to current to the brain via TDCS. I will describe two experiments which ultimately led to negative uh, conclusions about the feasibility of the current system using current technology. I just want to make a brief note on terminology. A bidirectional brain computer interface is a brain computer interface which reads brain activation and attempts to alter it using some stimulation. And in another paper that is also presented at this conference called Entropic Brain Computer Interfacing, I define a type of bidirectional. BCI called an entropic BCI. And to be absolutely clear on the ter terminology here, an entropic BCI is a type of bidirectional BCI since it attempts to alter states in the brain in a feedback loop. But in the more specific case of an entropic BCI, the predictability of sensory information is adjusted in order to coerce changes in the brain according to Bayesian principles. So, for example, an entropic BCI might judiciously time changes in the predictability of music or perhaps where it was originating from or moving in three-dimensional space in order to increase the brain's auditory computation and perhaps then, you know, minimize resources from other regions of the brain which were drawing from the same finite resource pool. But so... Entropic BCI is a type of bidirectional BCI, and a bidirectional BCI is a type of implicit brain-computer interface, since it attempts to change properties in some external system based on brain activation without the user's explicit awareness. So it's administering changes to the system sort of covertly. The user has consented to the system, but they don't realize this at each point when the system intervenes. And the implicit brain-computer interface, to get even broader here, is then in contrast to the direct brain-computer interface, which is trying to, or which is allowing the user to directly change parts of the user with their intention. So they're always involved in the loop. So consider the following example of an implicit brain-computer interface, which we published at CHI 2014, and Dan African is the main author. So here the user controlled between three and seven UAVs, or unmanned aerial vehicles, in a computer simulation. And they tried to make these planes go to targets while avoiding obstacles. We monitored uh, brain activation using FNIRs, or functional mirror infrared spectroscopy, as they're doing this task. So functional near infrared spectroscopy is a non-invasive neuroimaging technique, which we imagine could one day be a component of next-generation human com computer interaction. You could embed this in virtual reality. It's just a very lightweight, cheap, and potentially portable sensor that is also resistant to motion artifacts. So it works by 
shining near a red light through the scalp at wavelengths carefully calibrated so that they penetrate skin and bone and are primarily absorbed and scattered by oxygenated or deoxygenated hemoglobin in the blood supplying energy to the brain. Critically, these two species of hemoglobin do different things with that light, and you can infer the relative concentration of either quantity to a detector approximately three centimeters away uh, from the light source, and thereby make an inference about the brain's activation, since the brain is reliant on an oxygen supply. So participants in the study wore FNIRs as they were performing the UAV task, and the implicit BCI would recognize when the user entered a state of high cognitive workload. And it would then remove planes from user control to simplify their task at these times. And then analogously, when the user's state classified by machine learning algorithms operating on FNIRS data, FNIRS brain data, would uh, tell the system to remove planes from user control uh, when in that state of low cognitive workload. So this intervention improved user performance overall and it reduced their error rate in comparison to a non-brain adaptive condition. So after the study we considered, okay, well, what if instead of trying to make the user's task simpler during these moments, we would try to improve their capacity to deal with the task. There are these neuro enhancers reliant on electrical stimulation, which I'll talk about more later, which potentially could be applied exactly when you need a boost. And that is the design which motivated the current experiment. But in order for this to work, you would need a very short lag time between when the stimulation was applied and when you got an effect. So we first ran a feasibility study testing this hypothesis that TDCS can be applied immediately and for immediate effect. And that is what we're describing in this presentation. Evidence in psychology literature suggests that TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation, can temporarily enhance aspects of user cognition. TDCS delivers a weak electrical current on the order of one or two milliamps to the exterior of the user's brain. And critically, TDS seems safe. And in a sample of 33,200 sessions, which were all shorter than 40 minutes, there have been no reported cases of adverse side effects. TDCS has been used to treat depression, enhance language learning, working memory, and attention. So experiments typically use a more advanced setups, but the, the basic device consists of just two electrodes and a battery to energize them. Uh, in a typical experiment, the electrode is saline soaked and has conductive gel connecting it to the user's scalp. And in such an experiment, uh, and in the one used in this experiment, one electrode would be placed in the target of stimulation, initiating a path for the current to take from this target of stimulation to another electrode, the cathode electrode, placed nearby. So the current is presumed to alter the cortical excitability of the neurons it interacts with along this path, either depolarizing their membranes and making the neurons more likely to fire in the case of anodal stimulation, which is used in this experiment 
or hyperpolarizing the membranes, making the neurons less likely to fire in the case of cathodal stimulation. So for this experiment, which was aimed at enhancing working memory, we administered anodal stimulation to the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex at site F3 in the International 1020 system. And then we allowed for that current to flow through a reference electrode at a symmetrical location on the brain's right hemisphere at site F4. And yeah, this is a standard montage used in other experiments specifically uh, targeted at enhancing performance at an end back, which is how we measured cognitive performance in this experiment. So we're measuring the extent to which TDCS can apply stimulation that improves a user's cognitive workload as quickly as possible. So we're quantifying that delay. So in order to measure cognitive workload, we're using a workload induction task called an NBAC. And here, the user will see a 3x3 three three grid. At each stimulus, one box in this 3x3 three three grid will be visible. And which one that is will change for each new stimulus over the span of, say, three seconds. So it will be a new stimulus every three seconds. And the user must indicate whether or not the stimulus they see at this iteration matches the location it was at n iteration. And in this experiment, the user will be performing a one back and a two back. So in the one back, they're just saying, does the stimulus I see now match the previous iteration? And in the two back, they will be indicating whether or not it matched two iterations ago. So it requires memory and it's, it re requires a little bit more cognitive workload. And we were interested in seeing how transcranial direct current stimulation would enhance performance of either. In the actual experiment, we measured brain activity using FMIRS, but we won't discuss this any further because none of our analysis showed any interesting results relating stimulation to the FNIRS data. For altering brain activity, we used a Soterix 4 times one HD TDCS multi-channel stimulation interface to pass the electrical current, and then we used the Soterix TDCS CT to control stimulation and placebo according to a double-blind protocol. So in both experiments, users are being stimulated by TDCS and will perform an NBAC. We ran two experiments because we were searching for the minimal lag time needed for TDCS to administer its effects. So in the first experiment, we had the following design. First, the user warmed up, practicing both the one back and the two back, seven times each, which served as practice. And then in the second phase, the subject alternated between 40 seconds of the two back and 20 seconds of rest, repeating this 15 times for a total of 15 minutes. At the end of each trial, we then collected the accuracy of the NBAC, how many of matches were correct, what percentage, and the reaction time, the number of milliseconds it took from when they saw the stimulus, the thing which they were going to indicate matched or not, and when they hit yes, this matches or no, this does not match, and they're entering this on the keyboard. So. We used a, a between subject design here for the first experiment, and this is another thing that's changed for the second experiment. Uh, the participants were placed in two groups, four in the real TDCS group and five in the sham group. And 
neither the experiment nor the subject knew the groups, but the real group uh, received two milliamps of anodal stimulation at site F3 for five minutes. And the sham group received two milliamps of stimulation only for 30 seconds, which is a, a standard TDCS placebo, since you really only tend to notice the changes uh, when administration is being applied. So you notice, oh, now it's being applied. But once it's been applied, you just habituate it to it very quickly, which is pretty cool. So as we said, we collect the accuracy and reaction time for each minute. And then at the end, we can see the differences in performance between the sham and the real group. And while you can see that the groups who that was stimulated had higher accuracy, they also had a slower reaction time. So that hints more at kind of that reaction time accuracy trade-off than it does an actual effect. So we said, yeah, five minutes must be too short, just out of curiosity, right? And, and when, it's, when it doesn't really work with five minutes, it's probably not going to work with anything shorter, which is really what we needed for the bidirectional aspect to work. But here we could have gone down a different avenue too, because we, we also could have zeroed in on the accuracy component of the study, right? And we could have focused on finding a task where you wanted a slower reaction time, if this is indeed the effect that TDCS was having. Um, but instead we explored 10 minutes to try to get an understanding more of the temporal properties of TD TDCS and, and focus on this aspect just for one paper. And then in a later study, would, we could come in and investigate if there indeed is a trade-off here, a trade-off that is, that is induced by the stimulation and not an artifact of the users. So in the second study, we made so that it was a within subjects design. And in other words, the users would first do the placebo condition, perhaps, and then do the stimulation condition. You'd have a 15 minute block of either condition for each user. And then we also made so that in the stimulation condition for that user, you would have 10 minutes of, of stimulation instead. But again, the user was just doing 40 second one backs and two backs with rests interspersed. And at the end of each trial, we measured accuracy and mean response time. So in this case, overall, accuracy and reaction time was equal for both groups. And this indeed would indicate that the previous effect was an artifact of the user and how they decided to do the task and not the device. So we did get one st statistically very strong effect though, which is that during the last minute of stimulation, there appears to have been significant improvements to both the accuracy and the reaction time. And perhaps this is a real effect, and perhaps it's just a fluke, an artifact of the data. Basically, the results were negative anyway. Perhaps the real answer is more work just needs to be done on the issue. Um, because each one of these experiments has this uncertainty attached to it. And you just need to do a lot of it and study and talk about it. And here's what we found. It's also possible that TDCS is meaningfully altering mental activation without leaving measurable behavioral changes that are easily repeatable across subjects. Consider a Bayesian account for this sort of intervention, uh, a theory which is elaborated further in the other paper I have presented in this conference on entropic brain computer interfaces. So by this theory, stimulation may be randomly affecting the brain 
in which case the individual receiving the stimulation should enjoy a more lively and random mental experience, either in exogenous circuitry needed to solve the end back or perhaps for others, depending on individual differences in their default mode network. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and I again apologize for not being able to attend the conference in person, and I would ask that you email me if you have any questions or thoughts and miscellaneous comments on this work. Thank you.